Does the speed booster turn a Canon M6 Mark II into a Mini 1DX, considering it will provide full frame bokeh, full frame 4K, and 1080p at 120 FPS? How does it compare to an EOS R? We'll go over image quality, bokeh, and the crops. Stick around. Hi, and welcome to my channel. This is my first video, so I'll properly introduce myself. I'm Carlos, and I live in the middle of the ocean, hence the channel name Islander. I'm a high school art teacher, and YouTube has been one of the sources of knowledge that fueled my interest in photography and video. So this channel is a way to not only give back to the online community, but also learn and enjoy the process. I'm going to talk about gear, technique, composition, a bit about travel and what I do for fun. I also plan on doing a series that will cover the basics to help beginners get their bearings faster. A few months ago I acquired the EOS R, a much needed upgrade for my old 5D Mark II. At that time I considered that I had enough old and new gear to start a channel that would go over relevant content for both beginners and enthusiasts. The R is great for video, but what about when I'm filming it being used? None of my other DSLRs do 1080p at 60fps, 120fps at any resolution, nor 4K video. In fact, as you're probably aware, not even the R records full frame 4K. So I want it. Full frame bokeh, high frame rate for slow motion b-roll, good continuous autofocus, full frame 4K, EF mount, good image stabilization for video, and lightweight. And all this for under what I paid for the EOS R, which was around 1500 euros or $1650. You probably know that camera doesn't exist, but you can get very close, kind of. I got the Canon M6 Mark II, a Viltrox standard adapter, a Viltrox speed booster adapter, and a Weibull S gimbal. So, how does this equipment cover my needs? Full frame bokeh on EF mount, the speed booster EOS M to EF adapter provides a 1.14 times crop. So, it's almost full frame and I can always use my full frame EF lenses. For high frame rate, the M6 will do 1080p at 60fps with continuous autofocus. It can also do 1080p at 120fps with a small crop but no AF. I've been using manual focus while recording with a 5D Mark II so it's not a big deal for me. Then good autofocus. The best autofocus performance for my EF class is to go for dual pixel autofocus on a Canon body. Image stabilization for video. As you know, at the moment, no Canon camera has IBIS, so I upgraded my mechanical glide cam to an electric gimbal. It's small and light, but powerful enough to take a lot of full frame glass. Lightweight. Weighing in just over 400 grams, or 0.9 pounds, with a battery and a memory card, the M6 is very light. The M6 also provides some features related to still photography that were missing on the R and the 5D. 14 FPS RAW continuous shooting and APS-C crop at 32 megapixels for longer reach on wildlife and fast action. Now, for the elephants in the room a lack of viewfinder, which is optional. As I'll use it mostly for video, I won't miss it, and I can always get it later if I need to. The flip-up screen will do fine for self-recording, as I intend to record audio separately. The M6 also doesn't do 24 FPS yet, but it will soon, through a firmware update. I know what some of you are thinking. 
why didn't you go for a Micro Four Thirds body with the speed boost? The IS is amazing. In fact, I considered the Olympus EM10 Mark III for the low cost, great stabilization and decent autofocus, and the Panasonic GH5 for all the video features. After a lot of thought, I realized that my top priority was bokeh, and even though a 0.71 times speed booster on Micro Four Thirds will get you a 1.42 times crop, it is still way off the 1.14 times that you will get with a speed booster on APS-C. Also, the F lenses autofocus and overall performance aren't as good as on a Canon camera. That's the exact reason why I didn't go for a Sony body, neither APS-C nor full frame. Getting an A7 III and buying Sony lenses would be just too expensive. I already had lots of LP-E6 and LP-E17 batteries around, so that was also a plus on getting the EOS R and the M6 Mark II. I just couldn't help it. Now, to figure out how good is the M6 with the speed booster, I'll compare it to the full frame EOS R. This comparison illustrates the expected addition in coverage that the speed booster brings to an APS-C sensor, but I must also note how the 4K crop on the R is close to APS-C. Bokeh adds to the cinematic look and is desired in several photography genres. So let's see how close can the M6 with the speed booster get to full frame bokeh, considering the same framing. As expected, the speed booster gives the M6 a bokeh amount closer to full frame than APS-C. If you want to take a closer look, just pause the video. Finally, let's cover detail. If you are a pixel peeper, get the popcorn and pour your favorite drink. This is what you've been waiting for. Wait, before showing you the comparisons, let's keep in mind that image detail is not as important in video because of its lower resolution. A photo may be printed in a large size and looked at very close, but a YouTube video will mostly be seen on smartphones or computer screens. Remember, even 4K is only 8 megapixels. Many photography and video channels upload or record in 1080p, and I'm only going to publish my videos in 4K because of photography image quality comparisons. Most of my footage will be shot in 1080p and then upscaled in post. Having said this, much has been discussed on how good 1080p is on the R, to the point that 4K may not even be needed. So, I'm looking forward to seeing how close the M6 can get to it. First of all, I'll use photography to establish how much detail is lost when using the speed booster. We'll be able to go deeper into the optical quality of the adapter and get an idea on how suitable it is for stills. I'll use the EOS R with a standard adapter and a sharp lens, the Sigma 35mm f1.4 art to get a reference on how this lens looks like on a 30 megapixels full frame camera. I'm going to shoot it at f8 to ensure an optimal performance throughout the frame. As you can see, in the center of the frame there is no perceptible detail loss. At mid frame we start to notice some loss in detail, but not enough to be noticeable in video. Towards the very edge, 
there is further detail loss that could be an issue in some genres of photography, where edge-to-edge -edge sharpness is required, but I wouldn't consider it to be problematic for video. Let's switch to a more controlled environment and use the Canon 85 1.8 USM. Again, the detail is extremely close in the center. The chromatic aberration amount is similar and a fault of the lens, not a speed boozer. As before, we're seeing less definition at mid-frame, but not enough to be an issue in video, especially in 1080p. Remember, this is a 30 megapixel photo at 100% scale, and the edge shows a similar difference as at mid-frame. Again, the less than ideal definition at the edge is a consequence of the use of the 1.8 aperture. All in all, I'd say the M6 paired with the speed booster performs very well where it matters the most, and is even viable for photography when the ultimate off-center sharpness isn't required. Now, I'll compare the two bodies with video frames at different resolutions and crop sizes. I've used the standard image profile, IPB and no log on all video tests, so we could get consistent and comparable results. Instead of going into it, I'll just concede the big advantage the R has by featuring all eye and log video. The point here is to see how good the M6 is as a full frame B cam to the R, and not really a replacement. These frames show that there is little to no difference when it comes to 1080p. Other channels have compared the R to the competition and came to the conclusion that 1080p quality on the R is outstanding. So it's great that the M6 with the speed booster gets so close. If you're using it with this normal adapter, the results are the same. When it comes to 4K detail with the same lens, same focal length and same aperture, the M6 lags behind the R by the smallest of margins if we look at the images at 100% scale. If we go to 200%, it becomes clear that the R is sharper. There's some slight aliasing on the M6 which indicates that the M6's 4K is indeed upscaled from a lower resolution. I've seen poorer performances by the M6 on other channels, which leads me to believe that they might not have used the same lens on the other bodies. The EOS R 4K detail is usually shown to be on par with the competition, and the M6 doesn't fall that much behind, so I feel that its shortcomings aren't as big as it's commonly perceived, especially for the price point and if you're doing YouTube videos. So, how good is Canon's upscale 1080p compared to true 4K? This is a big deal for anyone with budget constraints, because 4K footage requires more storage media and a higher-end computer. If you look closely at the R footage, the difference is noticeable. However, for my needs, I'd rather have a smaller file size, no crop, more bokeh and 60fps than the extra resolution. Before you watch this video, you might have thought that the upscaled R's 1080p would be better than the M6's 4K, but as you can see, it's clearly not. If you want affordable 4K with close to full frame coverage, I'd say the M6 with a speed booster is a viable option. There's another comparison that I wanted to show you. If you want to get an ultra wide angle 4K on the EOS R, you have to deal with the 1.73x crop. If you don't want to break the bank, you might consider the Canon 10 to 18 EFS lens, and it comes with image stabilization. So the question is, how much do you lose when comparing to the popular full frame alternative, the Canon 70 to 40 f4L at full frame? The funny thing here is that we are using a full frame lens on an APS-C body, and an APS-C lens on a full-frame body. Right off the bat, the loss of a shallow depth of field was a given, and is significant. On the other hand, the detail wide open, as I'll use them, is even better than on the L lens. 
So, if you prioritize ultra-wide angle detail or IS in 4K over bokeh, you can't go wrong with the 10 to 18. To cap things off regarding detail, let's take a look at definition difference between the two cameras at 120fps. The super slow motion mode is sought after by many budget videographers and Canon has been letting us down. Oh well, get ready for a shocker. You'd expect the M6 to provide better quality because of its 1080p resolution, as the R's 120fps is limited to 720p. Unfortunately, Canon's Cripple Hammer did its thing, and the M6's slow motion at 1080p is worse than the R's at 720p. The lower bitrate on the M6 in itself points to this fact. Get out! Wrong channel. I wasn't going to feature the Cripple Hammer, but having a lower quality slow-mo at 1080p than on another camera's 720p is disappointing. The M6 Mark II was supposed to be the first affordable 1080p 120fps from Canon. On the bright side, as other channels stated before, the R's 120fps at 720p has very good image quality and doesn't look bad upscale to 1080p or even 4K. Before I did these tests and based on other reviews, I thought I'd come to the conclusion that the APS-C body performs very poorly compared to full frame. Somewhat surprisingly, the M6 Mark II comes very close to the OSR in many ways. It's a small but powerful camera, and the speed booster opens up a new world of creative potential. For the price, and if you already own a lot of Canon gear, I think it's hard to do better at the moment. For me, it will be a great complement to the R, as it will not only provide similar solution for video, but also add new features for photography. It's just too bad that they couldn't provide better 120fps video. And that's it. I hope you found this video to be useful and enjoyable. If you're interested in what is coming next, you know which button to press. And I'll see you next time.